In this universe, it is commonly agreed upon that there are two types of civilizations. The ones who still believe in myth and magic, and those who have left such archaic superstitions behind for good. The ones who realise that the universe follows a hardwired set of rules, the ones who had finally paved their way to scientific progress. Everyone in the Grand Union will agree that becoming one of the latter is one of the very first requirements to sufficiently develop and advance to travel the stars, and ultimately initiate first contact with us, as any kind of myth and superstition will be nothing but a massive hindrance to scientific progress. Now, I'm not saying that any of us have a history which is completely free of belief in stuff like religion, witchcraft and other esoteric powers. It's just natural that an early civilization tries to find explanations for things they don't understand yet, even if they are completely based on primitive imagination. Everyone's heard of stories of divine warriors from the stars, descending from the heavens on wings of colourful lights, tales of witches and mages and magical weapons. But the most important part is that sooner or later, every civilization learns that those things just don't exist in the real world, and never will. That no matter how awesome or inspiring those legends might sound, they ultimately are just a waste of time. Better spend trying to understand the real world. One cycle. A new race made contact with one of our bioscience hub stations near GR42B, or Galice 581D, as they named it in their charts. A fleet of manned craft and the journey over 20 light years away from their home system. A clear sign that they had invented faster than light travel or at least some form of radical life extension or generational ship. We were ready to welcome them as the newest members of the Grand Union, as they were advanced enough for our contact protocol, and they appeared to come in peace. But one thing about them made us rather sceptical. They seemed to still maintain some sort of superstition, starting from the names of their ships. The jump ships they made first contact in were named Hermes, Archangel and Thunderbird, names rooted deep in their old mythologies, and a large part of even their modern-day media contain major magical elements, to the point of it being an entire genre they had dubbed fantasy. Some insisted that we could uplift and persuade them to abandon their old ways, while others failed to see further potential in a culture which had superstition embedded in its media to such an extent. In the end, we begrudgingly accepted them into the Union with a close vote, probably the closest acceptance vote in its history. Now, in order to be able to judge the military capabilities of newcomer races, it was accustomed to have them participate as special guests in the next cycle of Show of Force, a competition where every race shows off its best military technology by, well, basically destroying a bunch of armoured target drones in the most impressive ways they could come up with. I know, it's in no way a completely accurate representation of accurate combat performance, but in theory it serves as a decent way to get an overview of different species' technology levels, tactics and combat doctrines, and how they progress over time as they learn from other cultures and their own past shows. In a nutshell, wreck stuff and make a huge show of it. That's all it basically boils down to, but it's one of the most popular events on the visual broadcasting frequencies, and also one of my personal favourite shows on the Tachyon broadcast. And, not gonna lie, it also makes for some sweet propaganda just in case any hostile territories get any ideas. Now, for a few Union species, most impressive really means most impressive. One of the most memorable species in that contest are the Yim, who still hold their famous glory and close combat award from two cycles ago. I still remember when that single Yimtara warrior, aided by extensive cybernetics, advanced power armour, and armed with a pair of ceramic composite claws, effortlessly decimated all 100 targets, yes, even the heavily armoured ones, in their trademark Zamyi City Ruins scenario, in less than five minutes. The arena crew had to fire up the specialised high-speed tracking cameras to even reliably keep the Yuntara on the screen for more than a few milliseconds. And if you're more of the overkill type, then let me tell you about the debut show of the Amanjari, who netted the Strength Through Firepower Award on their very first show. They entered the Union maybe 10, 20 cycles ago, so they're still relatively new, and for the first time in the show of Force Spotlight, they chose to use the Sky Tower base scenario. Now, most species have used this scenario to demonstrate their special forces, working their way up towards the main spire with carefully planned tactics, position and teamwork. But they instead showed up with a giant, 150 ton class robotic suit, armed with their biggest and baddest weaponry, coil autocannons, terawatt pulse lasers, 
The thermobag grenades. Technology as many species still consider experimental, or even purely theoretical. I simply blew up the tower's entire bottom floor with a single barrage, causing the whole spire to collapse in itself, like it's one of those giant hollow shuya trees on our home planet. And that apparently wasn't enough, as they made an additional point of demonstrating their mech's sheer durability, by deliberately letting what's left of the skyscraper fall on it, only to climb back out from the building-sized pile of debris, without as much as a dent. We Zhou aren't one of those sure force hotshots, with only a single superior training award to our name, as we don't really focus a ton on our research on military equipment, but you'll probably see quite a bit of our advanced technology in the next spacecraft engineering convention. Just keep your sentries out for anything equipped with our famous thin field jump drive tech, or anything from ZS Interstellar Industries. Anyways, we'll see what those human newcomers are capable of coming up with. I bet it's going to be interesting. Despite the primitive importance of superstition in their paradoxically advanced media, the fact that they managed to develop interstellar travel at all tells us that they might have some interesting tech up their sleeves after all. And maybe, at the very least, maybe give us some interesting approaches. Well, it's going to be either that, or they'll end up looking like total idiots on the galactic stage if they try any of their magic crap, like the one and only time we tried to actively uplift a relatively primitive civilization, which ended up in them trying to call upon some sort of mythical god warrior in the show of force by drawing some indecipherable symbols and glyphs on the floor with some sort of paint made from burnt plant matter, and chanting in some sort of ancient language. Granted, the symbols were actually quite pretty to look at, and the chants were far from the worst thing I've heard, but of course, like any reasonable being would expect, nothing happened, and they stood there acting like something did, in fact, happen. So they decided to assault the closest drone with their natural claws, and surprise, they failed to do any damage at all to the drone's armour during their one hour time limit. I'm going to be honest, it was pretty hilarious to watch, but I have to say, I felt bad for them. Well, we'll see which one of those they are in a few planetary revolutions. Worst case scenario, we'll get an hour's worth of laughs out of it. This is the revolution. This cycle's show of force is about to begin. This time with the Terran newcomers as the much-hyped special guests. And to make things even better, I managed to get myself tickets to a live seat at the arena. The performance of the others so far have been underwhelming, to be honest. The Yim still use their tried and true close combat tactics, but once again failed to beat their record by a split second, while the Amar Jani try to show off their brand new deuterium pumped laser cannon, keyword try to, as the primary fusion Togemak apparently completely failed to ignite, leaving them stuck with, basically, an oversized laser pointer. Fortunately for them, the rest of their big ass mech still worked, but it just... Life to anything new compared to their last show. But now it's time for the break between rounds, and next up are the humans everyone's been waiting for, at least according to the broadcast show plan, that is. A few minutes later, and a battlefield had been once again completely rebuilt by the utility drones, while I was out buying some overpriced Aminaya fruit concentrate in the arena's stalls. This time, the arena was reconstructed to the familiar Forest Platoon encounter layout, one of the classic scenarios, featuring, as the name says, a dense forest with a small platoon of standard and heavy target drones, most commonly used to show off standard infantry weapons and tactics, with a few armoured vehicles mixed in for good measure. You can really never go wrong with making tanks go boom. And then came the greatly anticipated announcement from the commentators. Here's to our newest newcomers! The long-awaited Paradox Civilization from Terra has arrived on stage to show us their style of combat. That's them. One way or another, this is going to be sweet. May their guards give them what it takes, eh? Quipped the second commentator. Then, darkness enveloped the entire arena. I heard the airlock to the prep chamber open up, and at first I could see nothing but the very faint lights of the dimly lit hallway, but soon afterwards, two shadowy figures slowly emerged from the hallway. Shining my secondary ocular receptors, I tried to see past the darkness, expecting to see some sort of specialised nighttime combat equipment. I mean, to immediately get blinded by the arena lights turning back on to a dim setting. As I quickly refocused my vision, hey, at least it wasn't like that one time with the Nikra Stealth Plus Flashbang Tactics demonstration. My excitement turned into puzzle surprise, as I now clearly see the Terrans, one of which seems to be wearing some sort of colourful, but very, let's say, lightweight dress, covered by only a cloak, and the other was... plate armour and a cape? Oh, I think I can see how this is going to end. I start to chuckle, 
and it seemed like the people next to me shared at least some of my thoughts as they grabbed their snacks, looking at the towns with a universal expression signaling the thought of something similar to, this is going to be good. And indeed, the very next moment, the one with the cloak withdrew an antique looking paper book that decorated stick from a not very well hidden pocket, and immediately afterwards, the one clad in armour unsheathed a massive, unwieldy sword from their back, as the row one opened the book and started to chant what sounded like some magical stuff, although interestingly enough, the chants were in surprisingly fluid standard. But still, what else would anyone expect from a species who would still entertain themselves with stories about wizards and witchcraft? Take a superstitious species to the show of force, and this is just what you'll get, I guess. Nothing but top tier comedy gold as they desperately try to pull some supernatural crap, only to inevitably miserably fail and make massive fools of themselves. The robed human and the armoured human then proceeded to position themselves in the middle of the arena, their staff and sword lifted high above their heads. We summon spirits of Soul's Guard! I gotta say though, in their defence, at least those guys are way more stylish and flashy than the last ones, with their shiny decorated plate armour, the intricately designed and sewn, though still impractical and very revealing robes, and that massive, yet well-crafted sword. Wait, why didn't anyone tell me human eyes were capable of bioluminous- Suddenly, my thoughts were interrupted by a forceful gale of air, followed by a blinding flash of light from their eyes, which forced me to shut mine. I felt the sharp gust of dusty wind blowing against my scales and the memories of my closed eyes, and my heart was still beating rapidly and slightly out of sync, as caused by the sheer surprise. After the temporary shock wore off, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And I doubt any of the other spectators, no matter if live or on the broadcast, whatever culture they held from or which system they lived on could either. A haze of faint light, reminiscent of my homeworld's polar lights, flooded the stadium, as a robed human seemed to have grown an immense set of colourful, yet transparent wings within a split second, large enough to envelop half of the arena, carrying them several metres off the ground. And the armor guy saw somehow just spontaneously created several gravity defying translucent copies of itself hovering gracefully around them. What kind of technology do they possess? Is this even any sort of technology? But as it turns out, they had barely started, as the row one gracefully drew glowing glyphs into thin air with their staff before finishing off the free floating structure with a gigantic circle. And as if guided by some invisible force, they coalesced into complex geometric shapes, connected by a near endless web of lines, symbols, and circles, floating and slowly rotating midair. Some lit up the arena in rainbow colours, some were a dim red, and the majority glowed with a fiery orange energy. And then, suddenly, the entire thing's colour lit up into a blindly vibrant orange, bathing the entire arena in an uncomfortably bright yellow and orange light. Just as the roped human commanded, Let the sun incinerate them! Sign of Saul's wrath! Grand soda flare! Then another flash of blinding light. This time even more intense than the last one, and it was accompanied by a powerful burst of nearly unbearable heat radiation, as an enormous sweeping ray of something best described as pure thermal energy radiated from the crystal adorned tip of the human's staff, seemingly amplified by the endless crisscross of smaller rays coming from the glowing circles and mysterious glyphs orbiting it. And to everyone's astonishment, the beam completely vaporised the armoured targets in its path, charring the trees and fusing some of the silica gravel of the arena's terrain together into a solid mass. Just... what in the outer systems was that weapon? This kind of sheer power output might not be unheard of from the Union's best and most powerful energy weaponry, but there was no way that this was any kind of energy weapon that we knew of. There was no practical way a laser could fire a beam with such an energy output. No handheld plasma projector could have emitted that much power without overheating. And most importantly, no weapon we've ever seen or heard of seemed to draw its power from some sort of web of unknown ethereal energy. Barely a second later, the armored human had, in lack of better words, summoned up at least 50 more swords. Each of them reflected the arena's light in an unnatural, iridescent hue. And then the Terran simply pointed their hand at one of the vehicles and calmly uttered the words, STRIKE THEM DOWN! and the floating swords, without any delay whatsoever, propel themselves towards the tankers, tapping velocities like a hail of missiles. But they flew across the arena as if they were sentient. Their trajectories weren't at all like the precisely calculated, direct flight paths of guided missiles. Instead, they resembled the paths of frenzied warriors. Wild. Barely controlled. But with a single clear intent to destroy what they had been commanded to. And then they hit. A violent barrage of blades hammered away at the armor in a split-second rhythm. Every single impact accompanied by a mesmerizing shower of colored sparks, 
followed by shockwaves echoing throughout the arena. And on the last blade's impact, the armoured vehicle's Admo detonated with an enormous explosion, sending large fragments of composite armour, as well as the entire turret flying across the arena, right towards the armoured human, who in reaction simply crossed their arms, as if they would protect them against a 5 plus ton tank turret. But as if the Terrans previously shown magical powers weren't already impressive enough, a gigantic translucent shield now had appeared out of thin air in a Zaya wingbeat, and the turret bounced off of it like it was made from polymer foam, before solidly embedding itself into the ground with a heavy thump. Then, darkness, as the arena lights dimmed again to announce the end of the show. There was just no way any of this was physically possible. Had we overlooked the secret of some hidden natural energy that they had figured out? Did they hold some sort of natural genetic key allowing them to harness those powers? Were those primitive civilizations right, after all, and they just suffered from a very inopportune loss of energy, or whatever they use? I desperately wanted to know how their magic worked, and so I just suddenly abused the fact that I have a friend who used to work for the Zio Shua Force team to get a glimpse backstage. The term prep room wasn't hard to find. Just go to the room with the brightest and most colourful lights, and as sure as gravity you'll find the terms behind it. Luckily, they were actually happy that an outsider came to inspect their magic. According to the Show of Force contestant database, the Terran team consisted of only three people. Eve, Cody and Mika. Of which one was an engineer who only did behind the scenes... tech work. I asked the human in plate armor, who I correctly assumed to be Eve after she had removed her bulky helmet, how they did that. You see, one day we discovered that when the universe was still young, vast rivers of an invisible force we call mana permeated our galaxy. And they were controlled by the gods and spirits which we now call upon to... Nah, just kidding. Just some cosplay show theatrics mixed with some standard hologram tech and some customised terror military equipment. Basically a one-shot, overcharged chemical pulse laser hidden in the wand, and my saw beams were just some cheap pocket stealth drones outfitted with modified heat warheads, and you guessed it, more hologram projectors. Somehow bypassing the drone safeties for their suicide bomber program was the hardest part. But the whole floating in midair on wings of light thing you did. How did you? Well, the same way some of your hover vehicles do it. Miniaturised off the shelf grab repulses, just spice them up a little with some more hologram projectors, bypass the distance limiting sensors and put a bit of natural wobble into the flight path. You really can't go wrong with some huge wings and hacked hover tech. Although I do admit it was a miracle those things didn't accidentally launch any of us into the arena ceiling. And what was that magical shield? Focused high power electromagnet arrays. You know, the kind you use in coil guns and particle accelerators. I'll be honest, the capacitor banks and magnets in my armour were rated for one burst only. Don't think it could have even stopped a falling butter knife after that. Eve, now finally looking at me again and away from her smartwatch, noticed my astonished expression. Wait, don't tell me any of you actually believe that we could use, like, actual magic. I was completely taken aback by that question. No, of course not. It's just that we hadn't thought of using hologram projectors for that yet. Uh, yeah, sure. Anyways, any further questions about our stuff? No. I tried to regain my composure. Thanks, Eve. Judging from what I know about your cultural clothing, I guess Cody's the engineer then. Tell him that the Union would be extremely happy to get a closer look at Terran Projector and military tech. It sure sounds interesting. Suddenly, the human in the skimpy row, Charlie spoke up. Uh, I'm Cody. Mika is the one you're probably looking for. She's in the workshop right now. And I'm afraid none of that stuff's going to be of any major value in any sort of actual military conflict. All of that was just for show. Damn miracle none of that stuff blew up with the amount of modding, jailbreaking and overvolting we put them through. A voice who I assumed to belong to Mika shouted from the workshop further back. Now, it is commonly agreed on that there are three types of civilizations. Those who still believe in myths and magic. Those who have left such superstitions behind for good, having seen and embraced the truth in hard science. And then there are Terrans. They had found the scientific truth, but instead of completely turning their backs to their stories of myth and magic, they used technology to bring them to life. 